Welcome everybody to another episode of V Brown Bag. Today we have a very special episode. We're talking about VRO and VRA development best practices with Conrad Kappa and Brian Gerard. Just some notes uh, that we always do. Uh, if you want to get in on the conversation, please use Twitter. Those are our handles. Uh, if you have any questions, either today during the live recording or later when you're watching this video on YouTube, please use the Twitter hashtag uh, BBrownBag or reach out to our guests directly. As you can see, uh, Conrad Clapa is at Clapa underscore Conrad in Twitter and Brian is at BBG in Twitter. Uh, finally, you can tune in on our we have several shows covering different uh, time zones. We have APAC, we have Brazil, which just started maybe a month ago, EMEA, Latin America, and US. And finally, I'm your host, Ariel Sanchez, at Ariel Sanchez More. And now I will let the guests introduce themselves while I pass control over to their amazing presenters. Hi, Ariel. Hello, everyone. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so we have here Brian Gerard and myself, Konrad Swapa, and today we're going to talk about the VRA and VRO development uh, best practices. So, when we've been doing this presentation with Brian, we have understood that we need to change the name of the presentation. So, the name of the presentation will be How Not to Get Met, Developing in VRA and VRO, and you will soon find out why, why we have changed that. So. Basically, when you start developing in VRA, VRO alone, that's quite um, gi giving you a lot of pleasure. But when the challenges start when you work in a group and collaborate, and that can really lead into a chaos. So we'll show you today how not how to get out of this chaos and how to use the best practices. Okay, um, I'll show a quick agenda. So first, uh, we'll introduce ourselves a little bit better so that you know who we are and if it's worth listening to us. Then we will talk about how to start your journey with VRO and VRA. Uh, we will tell you how to build the, the dream team. Um, we will look at how to design your infrastructure for VRA and VRO. We'll show you how to start your DevOps adventure and we will finish up with development best practices uh, well, according to us. Yeah. Um, so starting with myself, my name is Konrad Swapa, I'm Global Technical Architect within ATOS IT Services and I work, my, well, my, my main responsibility is design and development of the service catalog for our private cloud products. I have several years of experience with vSphere and for the last few years I've been working with VRA and VRO. Um, also WVCDX in domain of data center virtualization and cloud management and automation. And as Ariel said, you can find me on Twitter and um, you, you can find some articles on my blog, vcdx211wordpress.com. Um, Brian, can you introduce yourself, please? Yep, hi everyone. So I'm Brian Gerrard. Um, I'm a global cloud engineer, also at Atos IT Services. Uh, so I've worked very closely with Conrad over the last uh, three years or so. Um, so that's given me about three years of VRA and VRO experience. Um, prior to that, like most people, it was vSphere, and I've got about six years experience with that. Um, within the CMA realm, I'm a VCIX6, and as you've seen prior, um, you can get me on VBG on Twitter. So um, please feel, to, feel free to get involved. If, if you're watching it on YouTube after, then Conrad and I would love if you reached out to us with any questions or any discussions. Um, so now I'll pass back to Conrad. Basically, he'll start going, uh, introducing the journey uh, as we've seen it, and then I'll pick up later on to, to go through some best practices and um, code reviews. So thanks, Conrad. Okay, thanks, Brian, for the introduction. So let's start. So the first question is how to start your journey. So for those who are not uh, really familiar with what VRA and VRO is, uh, we'll make a short introduction. So basically, VRA is a cloud management platform that allows you to provision different kind of services into private and public cloud. So the main uh, service that you would use is the provisioning of virtual machines and uh, manage the lifecycle of those virtual machines. 
Now, VRA also has some advantages that uh, you can manage your resource, resources, uh, mainly that would be vSphere resources in case of your private cloud. Um, you can create approvals and you can also manage your entitlements. And VRA also gives you um, some basic system for managing prefixes and IPAM. So those, those are the basic advantages of VRA and you can extend it using Orchestrator. So Orchestrator is a tool that can vi visualize your scripts and um, you can integrate with third party tools. So uh, it, it's basically extending the capabilities of VRA. So imagine that your virtual machine is changing your state. So on every change state, you can trigger a VR workflow that will connect to third party system. So for example, it can act, active the, uh, add, add virtual machine to active directory or after provisioning of the virtual machine, it can actually add that virtual machine uh, to your CMDB system. Um, the VRO also allows you to create everything as a service workflows and integrate that with VRA. So you can publish uh, custom blueprints into VRA and order, you can integrate, for example, with NSX or any third party system. So uh, you can order uh, software-defined network objects like security groups or uh, load balancers. This is so, some of those objects are available from VRA out of the box, but ob obviously that has some limits. So in some cases, you will find out that you will need to work directly with NSX API uh, to be able to create some um, NSX objects that you require. Okay, so this is this is the basics of what VRA and VRO is. Uh, we would like to recommend you to go to hands-on lab to try it yourself if you haven't done it before so that you can have better understanding. Okay, having that, we would like to switch to understand how you build your dream team. So as you probably um, in the organization that you work in and you're um, in the division of the infrastructure, you would mo most of the people that work with you would be sysadmins. So when you start your journey, you're able to develop and design good infrastructure. However, when it comes to writing workflows in VRO, um, they can, the, the code might, might not be ideal. Um, so we are used to writing scripts, but we are not the true developers. So introduction of a developer to your team would cost to have good practices, development practices introduced, but it can still lead to have some bugs that are not spotted. So what we recommend is to build a team of sys administrators or, or architects plus a developer plus a tester. So this would result in good infrastructure and also in good code and without without bugs. Okay, there there are yeah. certain so, so, right, just to, to go back to that slide um, just to add to, to that slide um, I mean, most, most places probably still have traditional silos, um, so you've got these people within your organization, but not necessarily within the same team. So it really is key to integrate into one team and have a cross-functional team so that you're learning off each other, and that's really key to producing a good um, you know, private cloud development team. Yeah, we have learned that the, the people who are sysad means they, they get more and more skills, and you can um, exchange your skills between developers and sysadmin, so we actually, at some stage, we end up having a cross-functional team. Yeah, That's exactly. Great. Thanks for that remark, Brent. Okay, um, at the startup, the skill sets that are required, as we said, that the um, tester can be all, the sysadmins can also be a testers, but basically, if we're talking about the roles within uh, within the team, we'll say that sysadmin needs to have an understanding on, of the, v, the whole VRLI suite. So we'll be providing our services out of the VRLI suite, so they need to understand how, um, how the vSphere stack works and also how VRA and VRO works. The developer, as they are mainly developing in JavaScript, so they need to have good understanding of JavaScript. They also should understand how VRO and VRA work. And we have noticed that one of the most essential skills to integrate with third-party tools would be REST API. Um, some of the systems might use SOAP, but we've seen that it's, it's actually a must if you want to integrate with third parties. 
And when it comes to testers, the testers need to have at least basic understanding of the JavaScript that they can look in the workflows that have been created and identify what well, identify the bugs. And they also should have basic understanding of the Vero like suite. Now, what we have learned, testers really need to be supported by the sysadmins. admins. Um, the testers come from different environments, so there might be um, they might have been developers in their previous life, so they might need there is a certain learning curve about Virali Suite for them. Okay, so when we started, we have realized that um, we need to follow a philosophy of crawling, walk, and run. So the, um, the practice or the, the waterfall practice that, that used to work in, uh, in the past where the requirements were defined and uh, we could deliver the software in um, in a cycle of one year is not working anymore. So you need to start with minimal valuable product. So um, you, you define what is really required for your customer uh, to work with the product, and then you develop it in cycles. So you do additional iteration where you provide additional features to the customer. And this way the customer can adopt uh, what has been delivered and they can define additional requirements. So to support this philosophy, you basically need to go Agile. So what we are using is the implementation of Agile called Scrum. So once you develop the minimal valuable product, you have uh, a backlog of features that need to be developed. So those features are developed in cycles. And then the cycles can be uh, very short depending on the requirements of the customer. So the features are defined by the product owner and then pick up by the developers. Yep. And just to, to add to that, it's not always about, uh, you know, it's obviously key to it, but the cycle also um, helps you revisit your code and um, it helps you revisit your design documents and also your standards. So it's always helping you deliver the best for your company uh, or for your customer rather. Um, because when you're introducing this as a new methodology, there's obviously quite a large scope for error. Um, so this cycle helps you keep things small, but also deliver most value. Yeah, exactly. So when, when we have the methodology, we have our team set up, it's time for designing your infrastructure. So the first thing you need to do is to get your requirements and understand the design factors that you're going to use for, um, for designing your VRA, VRO environment. So we have, we have actually, we have found out that there are uh, three main factors that would decide what kind of infrastructure you're going to, what, what sort of design you're going to make. So uh, the first factor is how many virtual machines you will manage you, uh, with your VRA. Then you need to decide or, or estimate how many workflows you're going to run in parallel. And if your environment is going to be ge geographically distributed. So to help, uh, to help you with the design of the architecture, you can use the reference architecture provided by VMware. You have the link uh, on the bottom. But you need to be aware of one thing that this is not always suitable for. So, so the reference architecture is not a must. Um, it's something that will help you to, to make the design. But in, in some cases, you might need to do some tweaks uh, uh, that will fulfill your requirements. So one of the requirements might be the geographical distribution of your systems. Yeah? So you might, the, the reference architecture for VRA 7.3 says that um, by default you should use embedded orchestrator, but in some cases, for example, the requirements we had to make it geographically distributed, you might want to use uh, orchestrator that is external um, on an external server. Okay, so just give you example of uh, two different designs of VRA. So on the left hand side, you have a design for 10,000 virtual machines. So you can see that those are actually two servers, uh, VRA virtual appliance, which is um, basically a VMware appliance plus the infrastructure core, which is a Windows server uh, with the VR, VRA application on top of it. And you also need a SQL, external SQL database. And you, you could have an external orchestrator. So you see that the footprint for such installation is pretty small, whereas on the right hand side, you have a distributed installation of VRA uh, that will support up to 50,000 virtual machines. And you can see that the footprint for 
the design is much much bigger and you also uh, need to use uh, load balancers um, so you either need an SX or external load balancer or whatever you use in your organization um, the other advantage of the distributed installation that you see on the right hand side is that from version 7.3 of the RA um, all the failovers, well, basically you have redundancy of all the nodes of VRA and they can be, they can be actually uh, failed over automatically. So you need to think about all the, uh, all the requirements have, you have. So if the main factor would be availability, you might even want to go for the distributed installation even though you don't want to support 50k VMs, you don't have that requirement. Okay, uh, having seen this, um, you should ask yourself a question, how many environments you need? So, you know, even though we, we say that you, you need to start small, the ideal and number of environments would be at least four. So you have your development environment where you do your actual development, you have the quality assurance where you would do your integration testing. Then you have user acceptance tests where the user will be able to test the um, catalog items that you have produced or the services you have produced and accept them and then you can go to the production. Yep, so I guess here as well it's worth noting that obviously that's the ideal scenario um, but we understand obviously there's a cost associated with introducing four separate platforms um, but if the availability is there then this is definitely what we'd recommend just on experience from hitting a lot of headaches when we had limited amount of platforms to develop on. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so once we, we have the infrastructure, so now let's talk about the buzzword which DevOps is. So DevOps is basically a practice that allows you to shorten your release cycles. So as we said already, in, in today's time, you, you, you just can't afford to have a long release cycles because uh, your customer expects new feature to be released more frequently. Uh, so basically, it's quite VMware gives you a lot of a lot of tools that allows you to do DevOps on the compute side, but when you're uh, trying to use the DevOps with Orchestrator, it starts to be a little bit challenging. So. When we talk about DevOps, there are basically three different uh, development practices. So we have continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. So continuous integration is all about submitting the copy of the code that is produced by the developers several times a day. So this would allow you to review the code and do the test and find all the bugs or review the code against all your uh, development best practices for development um, at the very early stage. So we don't need to wait until the whole code is merged or until the end of the uh, of the development cycle to find the bugs. Yeah. The the other steps are continuous delivery and continuous deployment. So they are very similar. Um, it's basically this practice allows you to automate the whole process of moving the merged code, merged, well tested and merged code into production. The difference between the delivery and deployment is that in delivery the trigger for deploying um, your code into production is manual, whereas in the deployment it's automated. So you can, in, in delivery you basically have a, a better control when you want to trigger the deployment of the code to the production. What we want to concentrate today on is the continuous integration and to show you um, how you can introduce the continuous integration into your development cycle uh, when you use Orchestrator. So DevOps and continuous integration requires a set of tools. So we will just give you an example of those tools and show you what we are actually using. So the first tool you will need is a project management tool where you would uh, report all your issues and bugs. So you can either use Jira, which is an Atlassian product, or any other product like Bugzilla. So this is the place where, where you will store um, the requirements and uh, developers would pick up the stories that they will work on. 
Jira has uh, some significant advantages uh, because it integrates quite well with all the other Atlassian tools. So the next tool you would use is a source code management tool. Uh, it can be Bitbucket, GitHub, GitLab, uh, whatever choice, um, whatever tool you choose depending on your requirements. And Jira integrates very well with the Bitbucket, so when you uh, pick up an issue, you can actually create a branch. The branch will be created in Bitbucket, and in this way, you can easily track um, the code that was done for, for a particular story. So you would avoid the situation that some code has been produced and you don't know the actual requirement. The next server uh, is the continuous delivery service. So here you can use Jenkins, which is an open source, and it has a lot of plugins. Um, and it's suitable for, for, for orchestrator as it, uh, it can do maiden builds. You can also use Bamboo, CodeSheet, GitLab, depending on, on, on your preference. Uh, next, what we need is the code repository. So this will, will be actually a place where you, after the, uh, after the package is created, it will be put in this repository so it can be picked up either by the, by the deployment team or the testers uh, for, for, for testing purposes. And the last tool, which is actually auxiliary, so you don't need to use it, um, but, but it's very useful, is uh, source tree. So source tree is um, a GUI that wraps uh, around the uh, Git uh, CLI. So you don't need to, to memorize all the Git comments, but you can use GUI to submit your code into the repository. So as I said, there are many tools. Uh, I suggest there, there is there is a link uh, on the bottom of this presentation. I suggest you to visit it so that you can compare uh, the capabilities of all those tools uh, that I'm presenting here. Okay, now we have the code review process and I give the stage to uh, Brian. Yep, thanks Conrad. Um, so, yep, basically code review um, is obviously very key to, to the whole overall um, development within VRO. So if you don't mind jumping to the next slide, Conrad, um, I'll just show, obviously you've spoken about the tools that we've used um, early from our experience. There's obviously a number of other tools out there on the market, um, but how do they integrate with each other? Um, well, as Conrad said, the requirements up front um, are, are decided and th those are broken down into smaller chunks of work within JIRA. That allows the developer um, to pick up small chunks of work and it means we can work more efficiently. So you can see in the middle part here, once the JIRA ticket is created with the task in hand, the developer can actually then go to work. So the code can be developed, um, code can be updated within VRO, and um, they can then export that work to a branch from the main resource, um, main source code um, within from Bitbucket in this example. Um, so that's basically what's happening in section two, three, and four. So your developers developing in VRO, they're then submitting that small piece of work um, from a branch and trying to merge it back into the master branch. And that takes us to point six here, um, which is ultimately the, the review process. So if, if we do deem that that piece of code is accepted, um, we can follow the branch to number seven, um, whereby our, um, our source code will have a hook into Jenkins in this example. Um, from there, we can auto-generate a package within Nexus. So the whole point of this is that natively VRO doesn't offer, as Conrad said, a very nice way to review the code. We can export the package and we can import it into another VRO, VRO platform, but ultimately um, there's no native way to review that code, and that's key. Um, so once we've got that package, which has been updated in Nexus, um, we can then import it into our test environment. So this is when potentially we'll pick up any bugs. So you can see in step 11, the testers are going ahead on their separate platform to test the work, any updates that's been created. If they see a bug, they will then raise another ticket within JIRA. And we go back around this cycle again. So, you know, it's all about making sure that any bugs are picked up and then it allows us to produce a, a bug-free package to implement into production. Um, um, it's worth so saying, one Brian, of the key things, obviously, is... we're speaking about is the, the... Yep, go for it. Um, I think it's worth saying that, that actually this is, this is done, this whole uh, cycle is done for just one feature. 
So it's it's not done after we release the whole package. So this, this package yeah, exactly. is just one feature. So we can yeah. find the bugs at the very early stage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and we, when we do do that review process as well, um, the, the review team, if you like, should be this, the wide variety of that cross-functional team that we, we spoke about. So um, there should be a number of people who can review the code. Um, obviously, it's not mainly a developer, and um, it doesn't need to be a developer mainly because we also need the skills from the sysadmins. So I mean, this code could impact infrastructure-related um, code. So obviously, we need those skills as well. And it's, an, it's pretty key here that this isn't a bottleneck. So the whole driver for automation is to, to make it more efficient and deliver quicker to our customers. So we don't want the, the review process to become the bottleneck in the, the workflow as well. So it's key to have a, a variety of people there within the approval team. Yeah. So as we said before, this, the next one. I think it's, it's worth adding that this process of, of creating the code and review, it, sh it should be done on a daily basis. Yeah. This should, uh, we've seen at the very beginning when you start with that, you see that um, it, it has some bottlenecks that the code review where yeah. you wait for days, but you need to get um, to the point where those code reviews will be done uh, on a daily basis as well. Yeah, exactly. It's it's just fine-tuning that process that, to work for you. Obviously, if this is a, a new process you're implementing, then you know it's all about identifying any bottlenecks or any um, delays to that process and that cycle. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So, what what does a, a code review look like in terms of the Bitbucket side of it? So, this is just an example. Um, someone has submitted code for as to review, um, you can clearly see it's an XML format, which isn't the best in terms of going through that, especially if this is if you're new to this. So, I mean, it's obvious that the red banner we're taking out and the green banner is is introducing um, the new section. But out with that, you know, what does this all mean? You can see positions, you can see parameters, but it's not very easy to identify what's changed. So. It's also key to, to go back to the initial workflow as well. So we can actually look at that workflow and actually see that everything looks good, the schema looks good, and the connectors are all there. Uh, we can actually check the code as well to check that everything looks in place. So it's not simply about checking that pull request and just marking it as approved. You also have to go back and sort of look at the, the whole overall schema of the workflow that's in place. So once you're happy, with that, if you just flick back again, sorry, Conrad. In this example, once we would be happy, we would obviously, you know, tick the green tick. We are happy to do that, and then merge into the master branch. And as we say, that then allows the the cycle on the previous slide to go to go around, build packages, and let testers um, test that new feature. Thanks, Conrad. So. Once we implemented the, this new process for us, um, we then thought about how to measure code, the quality of the code, and how how do we measure that? We were unsure, so we went to the market and the wider industry um, to see what the the best way to measure that was. And what we found was this was it. <laughs> so, WTFs per minute. That is the ideal way to to measure your code <laughs> quality. So the left hand side we've got good code, very few expletives, and uh, on the right hand side you can see there's a lot of people not happy with that that pull request. So, <laughs> but seriously, um, just to highlight again that code reviews can be time consuming, and you can see when you implement that, um, especially if you've got a large workflow that you've updated, it's really important, as Conrad said, to, to make that a daily task and dedicate proper time to the process. And as we say, that this is the, the point where you want to catch any bugs. This is where you want to identify that you know something has maybe been missed by a developer um, before we actually implement it in our QA cycle. So again, it's about limiting the bugs that we do have. And again, it's about making it efficient and, and delivering on time and delivering the, the most efficiency to our customers. So moving on to to some of the best practices then. Um, if you just flick on corner, thanks. Yep. These are the VRO objects and depending on how familiar you are with VRO, um, you'll obviously have seen some of these before. 
Uh, a lot of these will speak for themselves, but we just wanted to show that understanding these objects is key to, to developing um, a nice, good, clean infrastructure and an efficient infrastructure. So, um, like I say, you have to understand these. So, for example, workflow. A workflow is a massive part of VRO, obviously, um, and it's introducing automation. But we can also do that through actions and scriptable tasks. So, why would we choose one over the other? Well, a workflow um, allows us to return multiple items in comparison to, for example, an action which would only return one item. So, all these choices to use a specific object will impact your design choices when, you, when you're designing and creating a workflow. Um, and there's also other things to note, for example, the nested workflow. So, that comes with a, a performance overhead. Generally, what we found is that it's not actually recommended to, to use that a nested workflow. Um, so, again, bear in mind these things when you're designing uh, your workflow. And finally, um, you know, you, you, if you're familiar with VRO uh, or not, you could actually do all of these within just a scriptable task. So, for example, a sleep weight or a decision. And why would we use this rather than just not putting it into a scriptable task? Well, for us, the power of VRO is actually visual, visualizing the whole workflow. So. You can actually see from start to finish, if you use the, the correct objects, what are you doing with this workflow? What is the objective of it? You know, it gives a good structure when you start to use these objects uh, in an efficient manner. Um, and not only that, it allows new members to your team to, to be able to digest the workflow and debug it in a, in a better manner as well. So, you know, just overall, just make sure that you understand these objects and um, choose the correct decision when you're creating that workflow? Yeah, in, in general, I would say that the good workflow would be that when you first look at it, you, you know what the modules are. You don't need to go into the scriptable task to see what it's actually doing, so it's well described and, and visualized. Yeah, and exactly. We're, we're trying to do that. The, whenever a new feature needs to be introduced, it can be easily, the workflow can be easily updated because it's from the first side, it's, it's easy to understand what it's actually doing. Yep, exactly that. Thanks, Conrad. So, some of these best practices, um, when you read through these, might seem very obvious, but you'd be surprised how many times we witnessed them not being used. So, the first step would be to create a good folder structure and a good naming convention. So, our example on the right-hand side in the screenshot, it's clearly showing that we've broken out the folder path to a specific customer, and then we're also grouping some common workflows into its own folder. So these common folders, or these the common folder would include workflows which can be reused by um, many other workflows as a reference point. So whether that be VM decommission or, or backing up. Um, so you want to have a good folder structure in, in terms of naming convention, easily identifiable. But that same goes for workflows and actions and all the objects we spoke about previously. Um, again, you'd be surprised how many times we see the default name uh, of a, an action or a, a workflow put into VRO. So that means nothing to anybody who's reading it for the first time. So you know, make sure, especially scriptable tasks where it's easy to, to neglect putting a proper name in there. Make sure that you're, you're giving your teammates you know a heads up and you're, you're actually helping them out when they actually read that. Um, and then reuse your, your code, so create actions which can be reused, create workflows that can be reused. Uh, an example we recently had um, was that we created an NSX action to call uh, the API to the NSX manager um, for one single security group, um, but we we made that action available that we could call all the security groups, so it's quite easy to have individual actions, just one for calling one security group, one for another, or all, but you know, it's make sure that when you're you're actually designing the actions or, or workflows that you're thinking about, can this be reused by another workflow, and, and how to make it more efficient so that you, your library of, of objects is not growing exponentially. Yeah, I mean, as, as we already probably have said, um, it means that whenever you need to make a change, you know that you need to change that one workflow, yeah? So that your workflow, if, if you create an object in NSX, as uh, uh, Brian mentioned, then, then you have just one action that you need to change, and you don't need to, to look for other actions that other developers have used. So 
th those are the things that yeah. you, you could actually find out during the code um, evaluation. Yeah. So when we do the code review, uh, we look for uh, for for the developers to reuse those actions. Yeah, yeah, and and especially if if you're growing as a team, you know, you maybe start small, but you're growing out. It's important, um, or you will find out it's important to to follow these practices so that. Like you say, your library's not getting untidy and, and growing. Um, so moving on to, to this slide where we're showing resources and configurations. Again, if you're familiar with VRO, um, you, you'll be familiar with these. But um, starting with resource elements, so, so these are really good at storing programmatic information. So we can host, for example, JSON files, which are a lightweight and simple way of storing information. Or we can also store scripts um, that our workflows will reference. So rather than having everything within a scriptable task in your workflow, again, this is a reference point which can be used for multiple workflows. And like Conrad's mentioned there, it's a central place where you have to update one, one object rather than multiple. Um, and, and personally, we also found that in previous versions of VRA or VRO where we um, wanted to export objects and um, resource elements really helped us and um, because we had requirements to import into multiple VRO environments uh, and the use of re resource elements allowed us to um, to import that easily. Also for configuration files these are basically global attributes so so once again it's about setting a, a global attribute here as a reference point and um, so these are obviously static in nature and they're not really intended to be updated after a package is installed or configured so um, you shouldn't have any these should not be dynamically updated basically um, and again it's a they're really great for referencing um, one single global object and again from a manageability standpoint it's obviously um, increasing efficiency because you're updating it only once uh, and finally <laughs> again Team obvious, but you're not hard coding any of these within your scriptable tasks. It's um, or in, hard coding any code. You know, it, it's it's something that we do see, um, although it does seem very obvious. Okay, so continuing on um, with security. So in terms of VRO, that will natively allow you to to, to store secure string passwords, um, which might be fine for your environment, but it's important that you you sort of discuss that up front. Um, do you want to store these passwords within VRO, or do you have requirements for integration into third-party databases? Um, you might have a security directive, which means you have to um, be aware of who's accessed the password or who's modified the password. So that's something that really VRO doesn't give us out the box. So um, it does allow you to integrate using API to a lot of third-party password databases. So Again, it's just understanding the requirements you have and making the best decision based on that. Um, we would also say putting descriptions in workflow and actions. Um, so again, it's helping out your teammates. What what is the point of this workflow? Why have I decided to do it this Brian, way? Are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, I was able to hear you. Okay. No problem. Are you okay, Conrad? Can you hear us? Okay, I'll continue just now. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, so um, putting descriptions in work workflow inputs are also very important as well because um, you could have, for example, an input of a string. So that could mean anything to to someone looking at it. So in the description field, just give an example of what's an acceptable input here um, and a small description. It really helps um, your colleagues work out what's going on. And again, especially when it comes to code review, it's easy to see why you've done that particular um, decision. And the same applies to any scriptable task. You know, let's put our comments in there, let us know what's going on. One thing also which is, is missed a lot is the, the native VRO version increments. Um, so we've seen this neglected many, many times. So out of the box, VRO allows you to increment any changes you've made. So every time you save a, a workflow, for example, you can increment that version. 
Now, the good thing here is that it allows you to flick back to the previous version, so you can actually revert back if needed, or you can even compare the differences between a previous version um, and the, the latest version. So, again, we see it neglected, and it, it's really helpful, especially in your development lab, where you maybe want to, to update something for a small period of time and then revert back. Um, and the documentation here, uh, if anyone has ever had a large VRO workflow um, without documentation, it's it can be quite troublesome to, to troubleshoot um, and debug. So, with all these best practices, we also recommend that you, you keep an up-to-date document set, almost like a technical guide um, for what the, the workflow does. And natively, VRO allows you to generate a full PDF export of a workflow. Um, so it'll actually allow you to, to generate that PDF, and it's really useful to to see what actions are being referenced, um, uh, amongst other things. So definitely, as part of a wider or a larger document, um, uh, I, I would advise that you use this PDF export. And then finally, um, you know, let the whole team know the process. So there's no point in implementing all these best practices. And what we found was when the our team started to grow. Um, we, we had to document these best practices almost like a, an architectural structure, uh, and then as part of onboarding, we'd make sure that the, the team as a whole understood um, what principles that we are working to. So, hi Brent, hi Ariel. Sorry, uh, apparently I have lost the internet connection. I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good timing. I've just finished that slide. <laughs> Perfect. You're you're fine. Go ahead. Um, can, can you still see my screen? Yeah, we can still see it. If you okay. Cool. Yeah. Are you able to flick onto the next slide? Yep. Can you see it or it? It's, uh, it's still it's still on. The... Let, let me let me make him panelist again. Hold on. So I made Conrad panelist again, and maybe you have to present again. Yep, that looks good. Um, if you uh, go to the VRO and third-party integration. Yep. And yep, yep, that's us. Back on track. Perfect. Thanks, Conrad. So um, yeah, so VRO also allows you to integrate um, with third parties via what they call plugins. Um, so you'll see a variety of vendors will release plugins to integrate. Um, and what we found was you have to decide on one interface. So basically, um, there could be multiple ways to interact with that vendor. So you, you may have the plugin, or you may also have your own actions to use API calls. And some vendors, for example, um, backup technologies may allow you to SSH onto their appliances. So you don't want to be in a state where you're, you've got multiple people developing workflows for the same product. Um, but they're using different ways to interact with that product. So decide on um, the interaction that you have. So will it be the plugin, a REST API, or a SSH? And also decide where to, to store your REST operations. So these could be, again, a resource file uh, um, and JSON format, format, as we discussed earlier, or they could be, be stored elsewhere in your the code in your workflow. So. Um, again, it's something to, to think about where you want to store these and make sure it's a consistent um, way of working across the whole team. And then finally, again, maybe sound, sound obvious, but you have to educate the operations guys in particular um, that vCenter is no longer the, the key thing here. Um, you don't want to manipulate a virtual machine um, and then risk the VRA database becoming out of sync. So especially when you're working with perhaps day two operations. So you might create some a service catalog which will add storage or uh, integrate in any other say, day two operation. There's an overhead if that if you contact vCenter directly. So always use the, the reconfigure option within VRA and then that means that you don't have to run an inventory after every day two operation. Yeah, you might even consider about narrowing the permissions that you give to vCenter for your operation team uh, so that no one by mistake even or by not being aware modify your virtual machines in the vCenter. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, and then um, finally, just to speak about some of the VRA best practices that we've had. Again, naming conventions, again, it might seem obvious, but make sure all your objects are consistently named. So whether that be services or entitlements or blueprints. And then depending on the version of VRA you're using, um, use build profiles or property groups. So th th these are really good. They're basically um, a group which holds common properties and they can be attached to multiple blueprints. So again, from a manageability standpoint, um, you're not having to update custom properties on multiple blueprints. You've got a central location here where you can update and it's nice and quick. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier that we had requirements to export and import um, VRA objects. So we did find issues with special characters in any of the, the naming conventions. So we would advise against using any special characters when you're, you're naming your, um, your VRA objects. Um, also, if you're using VRA as a portal, um, the out-the-box out catalog forms might not give you exactly what you want. So there's different methods to, to customize this through what's called ASD um, or the design designer now within the latest version. Um, so that will basically allow you to manipulate the presentation of a, a, a catalog form. And there's multiple ways to do that as well. So there's either through the ASD form itself or through the presentation layer in VRO. Now personally, we feel that the VRO presentation layer is the ideal way to do that. Again, it's easier to export and import. Any changes will go through the, um, the code review process. But it's something you might want to think about. Um, certainly, as I say, if out the box, it doesn't meet your requirements. And then the last one I wanted to mention, that this is a bit of a unique use case, but we also had a, a requirement um, where we had geographically split deployments. So we had a lot of vCenter endpoints, and as a consequence, without the uh, out of the box in VRA, that would then require you to have multiple blueprints of the same nature, um, obviously pointing towards each vCenter endpoint. So we found, again, using the, the resource elements we spoke of earlier, we can programmatically update that so that um, a, a deployment would then only need to reference one of a number of blueprints. So we could share those blueprints amongst a larger target area, uh, amongst all the multiple endpoints we had. Um, and that definitely helped us, again, from a manageability standpoint um, and helped the operations guys when it came to having to update blueprints. And so rather than having multiple blueprints to update, we had a limited amount. So I mean, that, that's just one we wanted to put in. We're quite happy to, to speak about that again, if needed. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically our, oh, sorry, Conrad, on you go. Yeah, I mean, the key here is the simplicity yeah? and, and, and make it as minimal exactly. footprint as, as possible and make it as manageable as possible. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have seen that already a number of challenges, but we have identified when, when you're going deeper into development with VRA and VRO, and especially when you need to uh, integrate orchestrator with VRA and modify objects, there are a number of challenges that can show up. Uh, so the first challenge would be when you need to modify VRA objects. So I'm talking about objects like entitlements, manage virtual machines, approvals uh, or uh, tenants, etc. cetera. Um, so those objects, you, you basically have a plugin for VRA that can that allow you to modify a lot of objects, but it, it doesn't have all the options that you require. So you need to bear in mind that there are actually two databases. So when, when we've been talking about the infrastructure, I'll show you that there is a VRA appliance and a YAS server. So basically, the VRA appliance has the vPostgres database, and uh, the EAS uh, server, it's using the SQL uh, server. So you need to bear in mind that the objects from VRA, the ones that you see in the portal, they can be either stored in the vPostgres database or the SQL database. So just to give you an example, um, when we're talking about the virtual managed virtual machines, th those entities would be stored in the uh, SQL database, whereas the items, so basically the items that you have provisioned, like virtual machines or any other objects that you have mapped to VRA, 
um, that would be stored uh, in the vPostgres database. As we said, the, um, you have plugins for a number of third-party systems, but what we have noticed that for VRA, for example, a lot of methods um, that, that are in the API Explorer um, and they are not covered by the workflows, they don't actually have descriptions. So sometimes you need to uh, try and just run the methods to see what the outcome would be to understand uh, what, what is it for. Fortunately, the naming convention for the methods are quite self-explanatory, so it helps you out. Yeah, and just uh, another good way or good reason for using API Explorer, um, if you're familiar with Java, uh, with VRO, you'll realize that it uses JavaScript, but it seems to be a cut-down version of JavaScript, so not every method is available. So it's always good to, to use the API Explorer, which will tell you, you know, exactly what VRA see, uh, VRO sees rather than you know, the experience you may have for using JavaScript elsewhere. Yeah, it's quite a surprise when you're trying to use a JavaScript method and it throws you that it does not exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, we, we still have some tools that we can use to um, combat the challenges that we have. So the first tool uh, I spoke is the VRO API Explorer. So here you have uh, a screenshot of how it looks like. So when you go to the um, VRO uh, client, um, you, you can uh, you can enter the API Explorer. There is an icon on the right hand top side, and here you have all the methods that are used by the plugins uh, you have installed. The second tool um, is the actual SQL Management Studio, so the tool that all of us know. Uh, so you can actually use it to connect to VRA, um, the ES, ES server database, and you can view all the objects in the tables. And it's quite quite useful because you can actually make the queries, so you can see the values of the objects, not only the table, um, so that you can figure out uh, the values, not only the attributes that the ES server objects will have. Uh, another tool that we use is the PGA admin. Um, you, you can use whatever tool allows you to manage the vPostgres database. That's the basic tool. Uh, that we use, so it, it's very similar to the SQL Management Studio. Again, you can see the values um, of the objects in your database and, and, and figure out how you can access them. Uh, so as I said already, the objects in VRA are not the same objects as you have in the ES uh, server. In this way, you can find out where the object is located. And the last tool, which is uh, pretty similar to, well, it, it's used for getting your object from your uh, ES server, is LinkPad4. So it allows you to browse your ma uh, management model of the ES entities. So it also allows you to make queries. But this directly shows you what are the uh, ES server entities. So uh, if you do a bigger deep dive how to manage ES objects, you'll see that it's using the concept of entities so it's uh, even the method of how you access the object in uh, VRA appliance and the ES server is slightly different. Okay, so those are the number two number of tools that uh, well I, I suggest to to get yourself familiar with. It can save you a lot of time and allows you to do some really good customizations that that, that you won't be able to do out of the box, but it requires some time to get to use to them and, and, and you need to a little bit of practice, but they're, they're perfect tools for any customizations. Okay, um, so that would be it. We don't want to leave you without uh, further information. So uh, we have a number of links here and suggestions where to continue um, the learning uh, of VRO and VRA. So as I said, try hands on lap. Um, there, are number, there are also a number of free courses. One of the very basic is Viralize Orchestrator for Viralize Automation 6.1. We know that this is a little bit outdated, but to get the fundamental understanding of how Orchestrator uh, works with Viralize Automation, it's a really good resource. And also we have a number of, of blocks uh, that we think are very useful. Um, and also, there is a really good document on coding uh, design guide provided by VMware. Um, so we suggest that you get familiar yourself with that.
Okay, so thanks for attention. As Brian said before, uh, we are more than happy to answer any question you might have on Twitter uh, or, or on one of our, or I either contact Brian or myself, and we'll be more than happy to answer any of your doubts. Thanks a lot. Yep, thanks guys. Just to echo what Conrad said there, um, but we're really keen to speak to anyone, you know, um, if you've got different ways of approaching what we spoke about, then we're always keen um, to, to learn and hear other views. So yeah, reach out guys and we're happy to have a chat. Thanks. Awesome. So guys, I really appreciate this presentation. I think it was really good. I posted a bunch of uh, screenshots out on Twitter. Um, I have to thank you because it was really great. Uh, we didn't have any questions until right now. And the only question that we got was, thank you so much. I think everybody was, we had like five, six attendees at most live, but we really appreciate it. It was really cool. And uh, I'll stop the recording right now.